Good morning. I'm Alyssa Murphy, CEO and founder. And I'm Jan Bonat, Germany's head of campaigns. And we are Life Science. We are champions of the clean tech industry. We believe in its potential to tackle the greatest challenges of our time. And for the last 10 years, we have been using communications to help build market leading companies across Europe. So good morning and welcome to our second webinar. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how your technology can do the talking for you. At the beginning of the webinar, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. So if you could use the chat function, and thank you to those who have already said hello to us, um, we would love to hear your name and also what your last PR headline was. So go ahead and type those in the chat function and we'll introduce you to the rest of the participants. We checked this out at Life Size and our last PR headline was... Die Klimadebatte hilft clean tech companies. Or the climate debate helps clean tech companies. So please go ahead and share those. And while you're doing that, Jan is going to do a brief introduction for us. Since we have a high number of participants joining us for the first time today, we would like to take the opportunity to convey our understanding of the cleantech landscape. Now, cleantech is diverse, as you can see, um, looking at the industries listed below. We focus on companies that have the potential to make a significant difference. So if you see yourself in one of those sectors listed below, you are in the right place, then this webinar will be helpful for you. Okay, um, I'm just, oh, sorry, excuse me. I'm just gonna ask uh, Jan to open up the chat box for me. I think we've had some introductions already. Um, so hello to Tavo from Fusebox and um, also to Marta, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, and Laura um, from SimPower, whose latest headline was International Expansion from SimPower, Pioneering Demand Response in Israel. What a great, great headline. headline. Um, keep those coming. Um, we will um, keep sharing those as they come in. Um, so I can just see one coming in now from Julian. Um, um, and I'm sorry, I can't quite read this, but I think he was saying that he was previously working in SaaS B2B, so a little bit of a different topic. Um, hello, it's great that you're joining us for the Clean Tech Yes, webinar. thank you. Um, hello also to Zina from Wurzburg, um, whose last headline was, Trucks Can Help Clean Up Europe's Motorways. Exciting. And I've just seen that Fusebox um, shared their headline, which was Fusebox balances electricity markets by using electricity consumers' flexibility, by using their flexibility and putting some money back into their pockets. Um, great. So keep those coming. Jan will keep an eye on those as we move into the next section. So we, uh, we wanted to spark pre um, creativity right at the beginning of the webinar to set the right tone. And my colleague Jan has a little bit of a thing for haikus. So um, Jan has written us a haiku today. But Jan, can you explain first of all why you wanted to write a haiku for us? Of course. So I think the secret of the haiku is that it's very short and concise. And that's something that we should always keep in mind for PR work as well. Also, I think it's about getting to the core of the story. And I think this is what I've been trying to do with the little haiku for our webinar. So I'm just gonna read it out for you. Finding a story, hoping to make the headline, but how is it done? Thank you. You're welcome. So, and the how is it done part is actually the main focus of our webinar today. Let's just briefly walk through what we have planned for you guys today. First, we'll actually focus on the differences between marketing and PR and explain why you shouldn't talk to everyone in the same way. Also, just broadcasting your news won't really help you much. This is something that we're going to cover later. We have chosen the topic for the webinar for a reason. The timing couldn't be better to start your PR work. We tell you why and what you need to keep in mind before launching your PR with new power. So in the webinar, we really want to focus on sharing practical tools with you, and we're going to go through a number of instruments to really enable you to uh, put into practice what we're talking about here today and let your technology do the talking. Um, so we're then going to look at some real-life case studies from PR campaigns that we've delivered for our clients. And then finally, we're going to end up with some, some concluding thoughts, and then we're going to open up 
to Q&A. So if you are joining us live, which everyone here right now is, um, go ahead and share your questions. Just to confuse things, um, I asked you to share in the chat box, but if you could try to do that in the Q&A function, that makes it a little bit easier for us to curate, but we'll keep an eye on the chat box as well, um, just in case. As we go through, we will do our best to keep an eye on the questions and answer any that are directly related to the content that we're discussing at the time. But rest assured that we will get through all of the questions at the end when we get to the Q&A. If you're not joining us live, needless to say, the Q&A function is not really going to help you. Um, so if for any reason you have questions after the webinar or at any other point, you can reach us on Twitter at Life Size Media or the same name on LinkedIn. And of course, you can email us at any time, mail at lifesizemedia.com. So just before we get started, I also wanted to say um, hello to Ali from Liquid Wind in Sweden. Um, and the title of their first and only PR so far was Liquid Wind, a Swedish alternative fuel company raises over, and I can't see the number, um, <laughs> but uh, there we go. Um, Two million seconds. Thank you, via crowdfunding. That's amazing. Um, it's very cool to see that we have such an international course. Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us. It's really nice to get a flavor of who is with us here on the webinar today. We look forward to um, getting to know you more and answering your questions in the Q&A. For now, we are going to turn off the camera so that we can focus on the content and our faces will be back in time for the Q&A. So let's get started. Will do. Do you remember your last headline? Where did you get your coverage? What helped on the way to achieving that coverage? We know that successful clean tech companies take communications seriously. I'm sure that's why all of you have signed up today. And for many companies, the first step is to appoint someone responsible for marketing and communications. And this is actually also a bit of a problem because clean tech companies often mix those two responsibilities. As they go certainly hand in hand, there are profound differences between marketing and PR. While marketing helps your organization to promote services and products and ultimately spur sales, PR is about building and maintaining relationships between you and the public. And this is a very critical difference, one that we really want to emphasize, and one that is often misunderstood. When you use marketing tools, you ultimately pay to spread a message regardless of form. When you do PR instead, then you build upon the relationship between you and the journalist. Don't just send them a press release and wait for it to be published. This won't happen. It might even actually damage your relationship with the journalist, and we will talk about that in a moment. One thing though that PR and marketing do have in common is that both disciplines tell stories. Um, and as we learned just moments ago, those stories want to achieve different things. And this is a point we want to emphasize. We need to have distinct messages for PR and marketing. Now, let's expand on this difference a bit. Journalists have a critical job when it comes to their role in society. They need to be impartial and write objectively about what they learn and observe. And I'd really like to emphasize here, sorry to interrupt you, Jan, but this, this is why a journalist won't just publish your press release just because you've sent it to them, which is sometimes a misexpectation that people have because press releases by their nature are the very opposite of objective. So you need to work hard with your press releases to make sure that it's really going to work for a journalist. Exactly, because the press release is something that you're, you yourself as a company draft. It's your story that you want to tell. Obviously, the journalists will have their own spin on it. And this is why it is important that you don't talk to everyone in the same way. You need to think about your target audience. Who are you addressing with your messages? What will your target group be interested in? And if you're talking, for example, to potential customers, they might be interested in the product specifics or the economic benefit of getting out of this product. Addressing a journalist, on the other hand, you might think about painting the bigger picture. How does your technology contribute to fighting the climate emergency? So just to recap on the most important lesson from this section, and what you really need to keep in mind before you jump into PR work. Before you start, really take the time to think about what you want to achieve. It should be a given, but it's often overlooked in the heat of the moment. So first of all, to make a difference and to make your life easier, think about two things beforehand. Is this a PR story or a marketing story? And who is your target audience? Can you give a real life example of that to make the difference a bit uh, clearer? Maybe? Sure. Yeah, actually, this is it's a great question because it's a little bit complicated, actually, because very often 
the same core story can be either a PR or a marketing story. And it's about the emphasis that you put on the story. So right. um, let's see if I can come up with an example. So for, for example, if you were to tell the story in such a way to say, our market leading cutting edge technology has beaten our competitors with an additional 20% efficiency. I mean, that's very much a marketing message. It's very inward facing. It's because you're trying to sell your product. Right, exactly. But you could use the same core story of that increase in efficiency, but work to make it relevant to a wider audience. So for example, you could say, breakthrough in battery chemistry allows X company to increase efficiency by 20%. And then just by making a reference to battery chemistry, you're broadening this out to be a wider topic that's of interest to the wider battery community and energy storage. Community. So often it's actually. So it doesn't just become about your product. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's the key, making it relevant to a wider audience. Okay. Uh, so number two, um, we have been involved in the clean tech industry for more than ten years, and having worked for a variety of clients, I think we all know. I'm sure many of you have this experience as well. It's very difficult to get high quality media attention. There is a lot of noise out there. So how can you how can you tackle that before pitching your story to journalists? providing, of course, that this is a PR story, really trying to formulate why your story is going to be of interest for readers of that specific outlet. And on a related note, number three, speaking of journalists, it's really important to identify both the right outlet and the right journalist for your story. Don't make the mistake of just broadcasting to everyone. You need to make sure that you're offering relevant insights and interesting stories to that specific outlet and the audience that they provide content for. So just briefly on marketing, um, we're not really going to be focusing on marketing in this webinar, but if that is a topic that you are interested in learning more about, I would highly recommend our first webinar from June, which was on grown up marketing for clean tech companies. And you can find a full replay video of that webinar on the resources page of our website. As I mentioned in the introduction, the timing couldn't be better to start your PR right now. We have reached a turning point in clean tech reporting and we'll now tell you why. Global heating and obviously solutions to combat it are getting more attention than ever. I guess most of you have heard about Greta's trip to the UN Climate Action Summit in New York, sailing the Atlantic instead of taking a plan out of the plane. The media coverage was enormous. There's also a chance for you to receive media attention, probably not as much as Greta did, but there is a chance for you to get media attention just now prior to the UN summit. More than 60 media outlets have committed to a week of focusing intensively on climate change coverage between September 16th and 23rd. So just next week and the week onwards. As the timing is right, what could possibly stop you? Well, um, not to um, put a negative light on this, but actually I think there are two things that could stand in the way of these new opportunities that we're seeing to gain media attention. The fact is that clean tech companies face two substantial issues, especially when we compare them to regular tech companies. So first of all, many clean tech companies often don't focus on the B2C market, but on the B2B market. So while, for example, a levelized cost of energy is something that we might be able to relate to in the clean tech sector, particularly if we're involved in energy storage, for example, the general public would probably meet the term like that with a blank stare. Um, it's obviously easier for the public to relate to something like e-scooters on the street than to, for example, carbon capture and storage technologies. And this results in an interesting phenomenon. Almost everyone you talk to will have some kind of opinion on e-scooters, but the majority probably don't even know what CCS is. This brings me to the second challenge, which is that investment in clean tech companies is often significantly lower than in B2C companies. So if I stick with the e-scooter example, these are companies that have raised millions of US dollars for their global expansion. But in clean tech, we're still kind of waiting for our first unicorn. We all know that clean tech is a very capital intensive environment and the successful closing of large funding rounds often helps to generate more awareness for the companies. This can regularly spur sales and leads to more awareness around the company. And of course, that's where we all want to be. But in reality, your starting point may be very different from that. The good news is that communications is a perfect way to bridge the gap. As there is more awareness around climate solutions, clean tech companies finally deserve the attention they receive. 
This is particularly true from a storytelling perspective. Technologies that make the world a better place have a substantial advantage over old industries. Often, clean tech founders have an interesting, inspiring, and motivating personal story, which is a great prerequisite for media attention. But at the same time, clean tech companies do face a number of challenges, and let's just name some. The most complex one is probably, though, that the general public can't really relate to the clean technologies per se. Um, in this webinar, we will offer a number of solutions to overcome that challenge. And the same is also true for the limited space in publications, as well as the high competition in the technology sector. Okay, so, so far we've been setting the groundwork for a successful PR campaign. Um, in this next section, it's time for us to get really practical with tips and tricks for you and how you can launch a powerful and impactful PR campaign that really gives you an opportunity to shape the debate. Wonderful. Now, we already talked about the press release and maybe let's start with the most obvious tool then, the good old press release. I think the number or the, the death of the press release has been reported almost countless times. And it's not surprisingly, because this links back to what we said earlier about the crowded space. The more people send out and maybe sometimes even irrelevant press releases, the harder it becomes for everyone else. You can't just drop the release, send it out, and wait for international coverage to come in. However, though, a press release is a still a valid and powerful tool. We have talked about the journalists time constraints. A release is an effective tool to convey basic information about a project or your company. Used right, sending out press releases can help to create constant coverage for your enterprise. When you focus on telling a story, we kind of came up with a basic checklist for your press release. Making it easy to find important information, try to include quotes from relevant people, and try to choose your target journalists very carefully. Press releases can even be or can even be powerful when journalists can't cover you right away. They still read about the project and can revisit you and your information when they need it. Okay, I promised we were going to get practical, so let's break this down for you even further. Um, here you can see a six-step process for press releases in action. This is something, a methodology that we developed for actually for our clients to really help them understand the press release process. Um, but I wanted to take you through it now because I think it can also be useful for you to follow as an internal guide. So step number one is that you have something newsworthy. It's a new contract or a project milestone or some other form of story, or perhaps it's something a little bit reactive. So you've identified an opportunity from a news calendar. Or a funding as we just learned yeah, from one of our Exactly. So you have something that is newsworthy that you want to tell your audience about. The second step is obviously about drafting a press release, remembering all of those ingredients that Ian just discussed and working on that internally until you're really happy with it. Remembering, of course, that you've got to balance what you want to say internally with what's going to be interesting to your audience. In the third step, you need to just think about some practical things like securing um, maybe a partner approval, um, investor approval, depending on who is involved in the press release, and also preparing a media kit and other resources to go alongside your press release. I would say that this is really not a step to overlook. The importance of having good images is incredible. Um, sometimes you will actually get coverage just because you've sent a great photo, even if your story is, is not that strong. It really does happen. Um, step four, um, this is, I think, the step that perhaps people most often miss when they're doing um, PR themselves rather than through an agency, and that is to think about pre-pitching your press release. So this is about having a targeted list of journalists who you've done some research about, you understand what they're interested in, what they're writing about, and you're directly sending them an email or contacting them to let them know that your story is coming up, explaining why you think it's interesting to them, and really yeah, pitching it in a way that's, that's kind of ticking their boxes and putting it up their agenda. That's a really important step. Um, again, this is about not just broadcasting. Um, in step five, that's when you're going to go ahead and do a sort of full distribution of your press release. Full distribution doesn't mean to every journalist ever, um, but it means to the full media list that you will have previously put together with care. And then finally, in step six, it's worth thinking about doing some follow-ups with journalists and maybe a day or two after distribution. I think this is a little bit of a tricky area because you don't want to just be calling and saying, hi, did you get my email? It's probably nothing more annoying for a journalist, but just 
a little trick you can use is maybe to think about if there's something else that you can offer the journalist at this stage. So perhaps you can offer an interview with the CEO or with the investor as a sort of follow up to getting their interest in the press release. So those are the six steps that you want to be following when you're sending out your press releases. And maybe just to add on step six, there might also be the opportunity to add a different angle. When there has been coverage and maybe you want to correct something also, maybe something that has been not fully correctly portrayed from your perspective, this also gives you the opportunity to just make sure that your story gets out there correctly. Absolutely. Our second tip and trick. Moments ago, we just talked about the fact that people can't really relate to clean tech projects. Storytelling enables you to overcome this challenge. Don't just talk about the specifications and certifications of your technology. We know that this is something, especially the engineers and clean tech companies that we're proud of, and we do understand that, but it's not really relevant for the wider public. Instead, try to focus on your company's wider impact. So how does your technology help society? The more specific you can be, the better. Don't just talk about that it will save the climate, that it will reduce CO2 emissions. Try to calculate those tons of CO2 that your technology saves, or the increase in energy efficiency. Attaching specific numbers to your project help journalists and the general public a lot. But even now, having those numbers is often quite complex. I mean, most of us can't really relate to just saying, our project saves 2 million tons of CO2 a year. What we do recommend though, is try to find an equivalent. After having calculated those savings, try to, kind of, try to come up with how much CO2, for example, that is compared to a country's yearly emissions, or to numbers of cars, or numbers of trees. Try to find examples that make your number tangible and relatable. And local examples are really helpful in that, like you just mentioned, like you can make it about your country's emissions or something that's more related to your, your sort of environment, that, that's really effective yeah. as well. It can also be an anchor point that has been widely used in reporting, saying, for example, the city's um, uh, emissions or anything, anything like that. Just something that the general public knows about and that you can use as an anchor point in your communications. Also, if your project is part of a larger strategy that your customers or a specific country can follow, this is great because you and your project do make a difference. And we want to push you even further on this. So the press release is, as we said, the most obvious tool to create awareness for your company. But sometimes there's an even better, better approach, and that's really digging down to the story itself. So some projects are easier to communicate than others. And that's why it's important to take a step back to make sure that you identify the fundamental story at the core that you want to communicate. So for example, as we mentioned, launching a new product isn't necessarily newsworthy. You want to try to focus on the bigger picture. Why are you launching the product? What will the impact be on your customers and wider society? And um, does your product have this, uh, is, a, is it a solution to a larger trend or problem that you've identified? Um, and very often that, that kind of thinking and those sort of angles can get you coverage that isn't necessarily a full story about you, but a part of a wider story. Working in PR, we know that timing is crucial. You need to be prepared and we'll tell you how to get there. Let's start with the trade magazines, because that's quite easy. Traditionally, those trade magazines will release an editorial calendar at the beginning of the year, often in line with industry events. Those events can be a great opportunity for you. Just be aware that also a high number of organizations will try to do the same thing. So don't just rely on industry events to publish your news, because the space will be very crowded there. If your industry is prone to legislation, follow those legislative procedures very closely. This will offer you the chance to comment on current and future industry developments and just position you as a thought leader. And speaking of timing, make sure to not send out the press release first thing on Monday morning or on Friday afternoons. Journalists are, well, almost like everybody else, I want to say, they enjoy their weekends probably if they are off. So make sure to find your sweet spot during the week. Also, keep in mind public holidays, both domestically and internationally and think about the fact that those can differ from your normal working week. I would also add that to that to just keep an eye on the news agenda when you're getting ready to send something out because it's very easy to have planned. I'm going to send this out on Tuesday at two o'clock and then you, you know some 
big government announcement happens and there's just absolutely no way anyone's going to be paying attention to these. So it's always worth having a little bit of flexibility around exactly when you distribute, just in case something really significant comes onto the news agenda. So, Your favorite topic. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So um, in step five, we want to talk about vision, which is my favorite topic. Um, you know, we all know that uh, clean tech founders are driven by a strong vision, and this is something that that builds clean tech companies, but it's also something that you can use to build thought leadership. There are two ways that you can put vision into practice with your communications. So as founders, um, that we often have interesting personal stories about how and why you came to start the business. And this can be a great anchor point for journalists. Um, I think a lot of coverage is very human led and this can be very useful. Um, so try to use that potential. However, on the other side, if there isn't a story, don't try to fabricate one. It has to be authentic, otherwise you will lose credibility. You also need to make sure that you are comfortable as an individual with using your story in that way. So to strengthen the thought leadership of your company, you want to be thinking about things like op-eds and blog posts. Essentially, this is about providing commentary. And um, these are great opportunities that allow you to convey powerful messages and put your story into a broader context without seeming promotional. Um, and this is why we really recommend using your company vision as a reference point throughout all of your communication materials. And of course, if you don't have that vision in a concrete form, then that has to be your first step because the vision really is one of the strongest assets that you have in your communication toolkit. These are the five tips and tricks from our side. And in order to make those five points a bit more tangible, we'd like to present two case studies to you. And we'll start with Arcasol. For those who don't know the company, Arcasol is the leading developer and manufacturer of high performance battery systems for commercial vehicles. And the company is actually a great example of how constant PR work pays off. By leading and communicating with a clear vision, Arcasol was able to achieve its commercial goals and we as LifeSize even supported the company with their IPO in 2018. Arcasol, as you can imagine, um, being the developer and manufacturer of high performance battery systems, has a deep product focus, but it is at the same time able to shape the narrative of emission-free transportation. By having an integrated PR and marketing approach, Arcasol is able to use large trade fairs and industry events to communicate about its technology and thus create constant awareness for the company. Alyssa just talked about the importance of a tangible vision and also the idea of um, drafting up ads as a, as a tool for thought leadership. Together with Arcasol, we developed a vision that communicates the most important goals for the company. And this vision is the guideline for all communication materials, something that we always refer to. And this vision combines both attractive goals when it comes to the technology as well as commercial goals. And as you can see on the picture here, um, we talked about op-eds and thought leadership earlier. And this piece is a great example of coverage we achieved recently. The headline, for those who don't speak German, reads, Climate Protection for Cities, this is how it can work. We were able to position Arcasol as a front runner in electrifying the public transport within cities, minimizing local emissions, and thus significantly improving air quality within the city boundaries. I would just add that in terms of this kind of um, comment piece, I feel that often it it brings more value to you and conveys more authority very often than press releases. Because even when a press release has been well written by a journalist and well researched, it's still very clear that it's init been initiated by the company. Whereas this kind of commentary really it looks much more like a journalist has come to the company as an expert, as a thought leader, um, to, to really get the benefit of their understanding of the sector. So I, I think this kind of work is really powerful. And I would add that you don't see the battery systems there in place. You see the technology put into action. You actually, this is what it links back to what we said earlier about painting the wider picture. You see the electric bus in a city lowering emissions, and I think this is really And that's something great. people can engage with. Yeah, yeah, and that they can relate to, because yeah. we all know how diesel buses are, work in the cities nowadays, and I think this is a great example of how the future can look like. And maybe just to finish on um, the Arcasol campaign, or the Arcasol 
example, um, we achieve an average amount of 20 to 30 pieces of coverage per month for the company. And this includes global titles such as Forbes, Reuters, Bloomberg, as well as national outlets such as Bed, Handelsblatt, etc. PR has been really instrumental in supporting both their IPO and Arcosol is also expanding to the US market. So PR has also played a crucial role in that. Okay, so for our second case study, we want to look at um, our client Danfoss Editron from, from Finland, who we've been working with for a number of years now. So they design, manufacture and deliver the world's most sophisticated electric drivetrain system, and they target the marine, off-highway and transportation markets. Um, they actually have a lot in common with Akasol as a campaign, I think, particularly in terms of some key uh, success factors, which are leading with that vision and technical excellence, as we've already discussed. A really defining factor of the campaign for Danfoss Editron is a really deep project focus. So the vast majority of the stories that we're telling are project based and then combining that with wider storytelling about the bigger picture of the trend of electrification. Um, a little sort of detail success factor that I think is quite important, um, again as a practical tip, is that um, we've created a kind of clear distinction between PR and marketing activities. So those questions we discussed right at the beginning of the webinar, that's a process that we use every time we have some sort of development from the company. And because we also handle, for example, the client's social media management, we have a really um, good sort of funnel to say, is this really a story that is newsworthy for journalists? Or is this, this a story that is interesting to a Dan Foss close community, but isn't interesting to journalists? Um, so, for example, some stories will only go on to LinkedIn, where, where we'll get a really great engagement there, um, and other stories will go out to media. And I think that's something that I would really recommend you thinking about, is that press releases and engaging with journalists isn't the only way to communicate. And if you rely on it too much, the chances are you will start sending out content that really isn't newsworthy. So on this picture, you can see the world's most powerful e-ferry. This is currently operating in Denmark and is powered by Danfoss Editron. So as I mentioned, Danfoss operates very much on a project basis and at a local level. Um, so you could say that their stories are quite niche, but the stories that they're developing are about tackling global challenges such as marine pollution, air pollution, reducing CO2 emissions and um, converting to electric solutions. And there are also solutions that can be replicated all around the globe. So by focusing on that wider impact um, in our pitches um, and starting our press releases by really highlighting that impact, that's how we're able to grab the interest of international industry publications that otherwise really wouldn't be interested in covering what they would consider to be a local story. An interesting challenge with Danfoss Editron is of course that most EV vote EV focus is on passenger vehicles and Editron isn't focused on passenger vehicles at all. Um, so again, you could argue that a lot of the stuff that they're doing is quite niche, um, but we've been able to shift that perception. So how did we do that? We've started with a really deep understanding of the media landscapes and the topics that are covered by industry publications and general sustainability media and mainstream. And that's something that you can replicate. It's just a case of sitting down and doing the research to really understand about, uh, about the publications and journalists that you're targeting. We then looked at the wider impact of the projects and focused on that wider storytelling. We've worked very hard on relationships with journalists and we know very much their preferences. We know what's going to be of interest to them. We know the format that they want to receive news in and we follow that carefully. Um, and lastly, for our press releases, we have a very strong focus on the step that I mentioned of pre-pitching and carefully selecting the journalists that we're speaking to. And all of that combined has led to really outstanding results. So in the first half of uh, this year, Danfoss was able to achieve twice as much coverage as all of their key competitors combined, which is something we're very proud of. And typically each project announcement achieves 18 pieces of coverage, which I think is also very strong. Yeah, great teamwork. Yes. <laughs> We're coming to the end of our webinar, but we were hoping that those examples were able to put into practice the concept that we discussed earlier. Before we start answering your questions, we wanted to share some final thoughts with you. We have summarized the four most important points when it comes to PR work. 
Number one, be authentic. That's something Lissy touched upon earlier also. Being authentic will enable you to build long-lasting relationships with journalists and communicate even at difficult times that will probably happen in the lifespan of your career. Number two, focus on your story and know what your story is. Make sure you don't get distracted. Number three, a crucial thing that I touched upon earlier, plan ahead. Don't just start the day before when you might have to communicate something. Communications becomes really powerful when you can follow a well thought out process and plan. And number four, invest in communications, not just in a financial sense, but also with your time and knowledge. And with that, we're gonna put the video back on. So hello again, we're about to jump into the Q&A section and we're really looking forward to answering all of your questions. Just before we get there, um, a couple of things. If this webinar has helped you to think more deeply about your PR work and get excited about the possibilities for your company, we are offering a free consultation to all participants on this call. Um, so please take advantage of that opportunity to um, spend some time with one of our experts. In that call, we will go through your top communications frustrations and again we want to leave you with something really practical so we will end the call with kind of key action that you can take away and implement right away to get better results from your communications so we will um after the webinar we're going to send the replay and and that email will also have the opportunity for you to sign up and we look forward to doing those consultations with you Um, secondly, we would like to mention our second, uh, our third, sorry, webinar, which will be coming up later this year. So um, we are going to be in the next coming weeks. We're going to be launching what we're calling our European Clean Tech Review. Um, Jan, would you like to tell us a little bit about our European Clean Tech Review? Sure. So we are going to send out a questionnaire to understand the European clean tech sector even better, focusing also on the commercial and communication side of things. And we're going to be sharing the results of that in um, our next webinar, which will be in November. And we're going to be sending out the invitations for that webinar in the next couple of weeks. And we hope to see you there. And with that, we're happy to take your questions. Great. So if you haven't already done so, please share your questions in the Q&A function. And um, at this point, our colleague Manon, um, who is on our UK PR team and is sitting right behind us, so you can't see us, you can't see her, but she is going to be helping us out by reading out the questions and then we're going to be doing our best to answer them for you. So we actually have already three questions from Laura who says, uh, first, so what is your perspective on participating in paid media? So for example, feature articles in top 10 list of Mox XYZ company, uh, for example, because they get approached quite a bit by publications looking for content, but where they request sponsorship for the piece. Okay, so let's start with the pros and cons of paid media. Jan, do you want to? I could start with the pros. Head? Okay, <laughs> oh, uh, great, I'll do the cons. <laughs> I think the pros are quite easy. Um, obviously, paid media helps you to get your message across. They allow you to more or less write whatever you want to. I think it's a great tool when there's no other opportunity or option for you. You have to keep in mind the, as you also mentioned in the questions, or and the high prices and um, sometimes I am wondering if this is already coming a bit to the cons about the right target group. Maybe that's something that you want to expand on. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit cynical about paid opportunities. Um, if I'm honest, I do think that if there is uh, talking about target audience, if there is a publication that is really spot on with um, an audience that you want to speak to and it's a very niche audience and you're confident that it has a high readership, then it can of course be worth the investment. But typically these are pretty pricey opportunities. So if you do decide to go for something, make sure you have some way of tracking um, how much benefit that that's actually bringing to you. So for example, like a tracked link or a particular kind of campaign attached to it so that you really know whether you are getting value from money. I think my, my main sort of concern, I guess, with paid opportunities is that I think that they're often recognizable as such and that people are quite savvy about media and they do tend to know when something has been written as a paid opportunity. A way around that is to use some of the tools that we discussed earlier, really thinking about the wider story. So just because 
you can technically write whatever you want, resist the urge to turn it into a big kind of marketing yeah. piece because people will just switch off. Whereas if you use the opportunity to really tell a good story and to um, do some of the thought leadership that we talked about, then I think that's a much better direction to go in with, with paid media. I guess generally our take on that would be that something that we don't focus on because we want to achieve PR, real PR coverage for you. Um, because I mean, that's something that you just touched upon. Also, the difference is tangible and is recognizable. And if you can get free coverage, that also is kind of the outside um, evaluation of your company. If a journalist writes objectively about your company, this will help you more than just paid coverage. Exactly. Great. Uh, next question. If you don't have a designated comms or PR person, who should be the contact person for the press release? Should it be the CEO? Well, that's a really good Really good practical question. Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends who, who you have in the, in the organization, but probably the CEO is appropriate. Um, and particularly if you're being targeted with journalists, it's not gonna be a case of that email address is, is sort of out everywhere. And it does, I think maybe, um, it, it conveys a certain seriousness to it that you're willing to engage um, on that level. I would like to add, though, that it depends on how available the CEO would be course, yeah. on that day or generally. So sometimes it's, that's why I would often say that the CEO might not be the perfect match because they're obviously um, not that available and taken up with other things. It can also, for example, be the CFO and going maybe step or taking somebody else in offering also C-level, but then um, the CEO can focus on the business side of things and the CFO is also able to provide a larger context often. I think the critical thing is that whoever you're providing as the contact or whoever you're putting forward for your interview, it sounds so obvious, but make sure that they're going to be available at the time you put it out. This, it's really amazing how, how easy it is to overlook this, that you can offer someone up for an interview and then they just actually don't have any availability and there's really nothing more annoying for a journalist. Yeah, and I think this is the main main focus here obviously journalists will talk to somebody who is c-level or a founder of the company and then it doesn't even matter that much who is the contact person on that email yeah. or on that press release as long as that person picks up the phone and answers the email fast and yeah. it doesn't have to be but I, I would definitely make sure it's a human being yes i would not use an info at or a mail at or yeah a press personal out. contact yeah. really helps that's also something that journalists uh, relate to yeah um, yeah, so you mentioned earlier in the webinar a checklist for press based content, like important information, quotes. Is it possible to share uh, the full checklist with the webinar attendees or some more steps that they should sure. have? We can send that in the email, just the follow up email afterwards. Correct. And final question Would you recommend targeting editors or head of news desks with these stories, or would you, re would you more go to junior reporters? I think this is a really interesting question mm -hmm. because I think it's a challenge even for PR professionals sometimes to really know who the right contact for your story is going to be. And um, what I would say is really crucial is don't send it to multiple contacts at the same publication or just every available contact mm -hmm. at that publication. So I think this is where the research, I mean, maybe that maybe Jan has some more kind of high level like general rules but in, I, I think it's more about doing your research to really kind of think about is this news desk worthy it's it's rare that that a clean tech story is going to be hitting on the news desk that would be a very, very high punching um story if you if you're really going for that level um so generally you may be looking more at a local reporter or a technology reporter um it's you want to try and i mean a certain amount it's guesswork but you want to try to think as much as possible about who is most likely to engage with your story. And, and I guess a little bit, don't try to punch above the weight because I think often that's not helpful. Yeah, I would like to add two things. The one would be try to, we, we talked about the importance of relationships before. So try to build the relationship before you actually need to send out the release because then like that is too late. If somebody never has heard about you before, then it's a bad time to, um, to start reaching out to somebody. Um, so that would be number one. Leading to number two, having the personal relationship is probably, probably most likely you won't have the relationship with the senior editor or the head of the news desk. Um, also, they 
don't focus that much maybe on the specific company and as clean tech companies tend to be a bit smaller in size especially in the beginning and um, i would focus on the more junior or more specialized editors yeah. one thing that i think we found very effective is during that research stage to really think about um so let's stick with our battery example. Let's say you have a particular type of battery chemistry to really do the research to see which journalists have written in the past about that specific type of battery chemistry or something that's closely related. So that when we talked about pitching, that your pitch is actually, I really enjoyed your article from November 15th about this technology. I think things have moved forward. That's what the story is. I mean, that really for a journalist, that's the best kind of pitch that they can get because you know, they know that you've read their content, it's, it's on their agenda, and you're offering them something new. So if you can get really specific like that, then that's really effective. And we have two more questions. So how can a startup company build a relationship with a journalist without sending news? Right. So I think one great way of building relationships is, for example, attending industry events, because um, journalists obviously also go there. So that could be something that just reaching out to your key journalist content saying like, hey, I'll be at that event too. Uh, do you have time to grab a coffee for 15 minutes? It's not more that it takes, but just introduce yourself, introduce the company and what your product is, how you differentiate it from your competitors, what makes you unique. And now then that you have started the relationship, you can follow up on that. That's, yeah. for example, one tip. Something else that I would say is kind of um, offering briefing calls. So being very careful that those yeah. are not, we would like to brief you about our company, but Again, if I take the battery chemistry example, that you know we are specialists in this area. I know you're interested in battery chemistry. Like, so essentially, you're adding to their knowledge. I think journalists are always actually very receptive and grateful for that. That you're just like offering a free opportunity to enhance their knowledge and, and let them know a little bit about the subject that they're writing about that they may not have known about before. Yeah. That that can work well. I think it's it's always about making it what your what you're bringing to the journalist rather than what you're getting out of it. I yeah. think that's pretty key. Just creating, I guess, additional value also from the journalist. Is really, yeah, exactly. It's exactly. really great. Yeah. Yeah. So that can be, for example, you know, drafting a white paper and saying like, hey, we, we did that, uh, provided industry insights. Um, there's also a format in Germany called background talk. So that's something that you use to not just speak on the record, but also off the record where you can do industry yeah. um, developments and such. Um, which doesn't necessarily lead to coverage, but again, helps you to build a relationship uh, to be able to talk to the person when you need to. And maybe a final question. Yes. So, would you recommend sending the press release as an email text, as a PDF, as a Word document, any other formats? I Very love this question. question. <laughs> I love this question because I guess I get ready. Well, we may, we may even have different opinions. You know, I think the, the, the sort of world of press release sending does change very rapidly. So I'll start with my personal opinion. Um, I believe that you should send it just within the body of an email um, and not as an attachment. Um, do, you, do, you, do you? I think Jan may disagree with me. Jan fully agrees. Oh, um, excellent. Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I fully agree. So the one thing that you need to keep in mind, this is why this is a great question. Again, journalists don't have time. And if they need to go to your PDF, copy the text and then you know yeah, it's often that the format doesn't work when you paste it somewhere else. This is a hassle. And then out of a sudden, journalists get frustrated and they don't want to write about you anymore. Because the thing that you need to keep in mind is make it as easy as possible. And that's why having it in the email body is great. You can, obviously, if you are very focused on the format, also attach the release as a PDF or a Word document if you need to. But having the text in the email body is most yeah, I would. I I feel really strongly that the format of the press release is completely uninteresting for journalists. They're not interested in it being nicely headed with your yep. logo and all of this kind of stuff. They just want the content. And I think you know, also practically, attachments often get stuck in spam mail. Mm -hmm. Um, I I know journalists who don't accept any emails with attachments at all. So I think it's another reason for not doing it. I also think it's a great way of signalling, hey, we've sent out this press release to yep. hundreds of people. So I mean, even though you know the email. If you put it into an email, they're not going to think it's necessarily just for them. But it's, I think it's a little bit more personal. Um, so I think by all means, have a lovely PDF version with your logos and your images to send out to customers and partners. But with journalists, just keep it 
super simple. Um, keep it plain text. And um, actually, I think I was just going to say this. I think um, the question um, came in: Should your media kit then be a link? Yes, definitely. Um, we we use Dropbox, but whatever equivalent you want it can to can also use. be your website. Yeah, um, have 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 a link in in the email if you want to if you want to share images and things like that. Just keep everything as simple and quick as possible. I really can't stress how inundated journalists are with emails and with press releases, and a lot of it is frankly total crap um, every day. So if you can just be the one who's giving them real value, who's really telling a story and making life really simple for them, then you're giving yourself a great chance. Great, final comment. All right, so I think we're gonna need to, to um, oh, sorry, we have got uh, one more question. Have we got some? Yes, we've yes. got a little bit of time. Um, yes. So the question is, what is a decent yearly care budget for startup in B2B and B2C space? These are all really, 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 good, really questions. good questions. Um, I think this depends very much whether you are talking about if you want to do PR in-house or if you want to work with an agency. Would you, I mean, so I, I don't mind saying that our, our sort of minimum engagement is 5,000 um, per month. And I think that's fairly typical of working with an agency. Um, so I know for a lot of startups that's, you know, particularly early stages, that's not going to be a possibility. Um, so there are some different options. You can look at, for example, for work, working with freelancers, you can obviously look at doing it yourself. Um, I think, yeah, I think it depends if you're sort of thinking about do we want to do paid spend, it kind of gets a little bit more complex. But to give you an idea of what you might be paying an agency, you're looking at like four or five thousand plus, I think, per month um, to have an agency relationship. Um, I think there is a lot that you can do yourselves, actually, that, you know, ironically enough, as an agency, that's why we wanted to host this webinar, because we're so often asked, like, we really want to do PR, we really see the value, but we can't afford yet to work with an agency, so how can we get better at it? And that was really the whole purpose of the webinar, to show you how it can be done. So I think often it's not about budget, it's about having somebody on the team that really has that remit for PR and has the, the time to be able to do it. Because I think something I've often seen when companies are doing it internally is that it's, it's a bit of an afterthought or someone's doing it on top of a really high workload and it, it takes time, um, you know, it takes research, it takes pre-pitching, it takes follow-up. So maybe actually in the early stages, it's more about time allocation than spend. Two last comments on that one. One, uh, you talked about the webinar. We do have the resources picture on the website, so there's a lot of great things and tools out there that you can already use, depending on your growth stage and so where you're at, that will help you to make your communications better. And the second thing is about asking about budget. I think it also depends what you want to achieve. So it depends on, again, where you're at. Do you want to expand nationally? Do you just want to focus on your local market? Is it just PR? Is it PR and marketing? Do you want to raise investment? Do you want to race or spur sales? All of these things in mind make it always hard to answer that question just on top, but I think generally uh, what you said is obviously correct. And again, finally, please, um, if, if we haven't gone deep enough into your questions, if uh, the question didn't come to mind, you can either just email us a question or we would love for you to take advantage of the offer to have a free consultation with us and then we can really get into the details for your company. That's totally no obligation, free, you can just come. Uh, have the benefit of some of our advice and hopefully put it into practice. So I think with that we need to wrap up today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody um, from all these different countries and companies from joining us today. We actually had um, over three times the participants from our first webinar which was really exciting. We hope it's been um, useful and enjoyable for you. We would also love to hear any feedback that you have on the format or any suggestions for topics you would love for us to Cover in the future. This is only our second webinar, and we're um, planning on rolling this out and getting better at it all the time. Thank you so much for your time.